Good evening. It's wonderful to gather with you again to uh, continue this talk. You know, I chose this, uh, this theme of the 20 top myths about the Catholic Church. Uh, the one mistake I made, I tried to do too many the first year because uh, there's a lot of material. So I just do two a night and we're just going to go through it. But the reason I chose this is because as with these two myths that we're going to hear tonight, what happens is the secular world uses these myths to undermine our faith and the credibility of our faith. Uh, they want to say, see, for example, as we're going to cover the issue of the church and slavery, they'll say something like, you know, Catholicism has to be false because it once endorsed slavery. And so you hear this and you t accept it as de facto, and that's not true. You know, it didn't flat out endorse slavery. You know. But then it'll go on saying, in the early church approved of slavery. You can see it in St. Paul's writings. Uh, that slaves are to obey their masters. Colossians 3, verses 22 and 25, and Ephesians 6, 5 and 8. And furthermore, the Catholic Church didn't even get around to repudiating slavery until 1890s. And prior to that, the church actually supported it. Why do they say those things as they'll say other things about other myths? Well, they'll say, okay, so the church now doesn't support slavery. But that proves how changeable the Catholic faith is in the Catholic doctrine. So if the Catholic faith can flip-flop on such an important moral issue as slavery, well, why not on other supposedly unchangeable doctrines such as the immorality of contraception or abortion or premarital, extramarital sex or homosexual sex or gay marriage? See, that's why it's important to know information. That's why Father Dave Heaney established the university series to help equip us so that we're not just accepting what people say about uh, any particular issue. And like a lot of things asked about the Catholic faith, there's only about 20, 20 top ones and variations of it. So tonight we're going to talk about uh, this topic about the church and slavery. Did the church endorse and support slavery? Did it, uh, uh, did it only in the 1890s repudiate this horrible institution? Well, the answer to that is no, it didn't. So tonight, to kind of approach this, I'd like to do three things on the issue of the church and slavery. Number one, you have to be clear about what we mean by the word slavery. See, a lot of things can be lumped under that, and as you'll hear, it can be very confusing. So I'm going to first talk about that, and then second, I'm going to talk about a brief a review of slavery, the history of slavery, what's been happening over the centuries. And then I'm going to talk about the church and the actual issue of slavery. So let's start with the first point. What do we mean when we talk about slavery? Well, by that word, what we're talking about is a condition of involuntary servitude in which a human being is actually regarded as no more than a property of another person without any basic human rights. In other words, a slave is a thing and not a person. And so under that definition, or with that definition, slavery is intrinsically evil. Since no person may legitimately be regarded or treated as just a mere thing, this form of slavery is called chattel slavery. C-H-A-T-T-E-L. Chattel slavery. slavery. But there are other ways that that word has been used, such as in reference to the slavery talked about in the Old Testament, where slaves were not, uh, they, were, they did belong to the family, they were owned by the family, but it was more, more in a familial relationship. You remember Abraham and Sarah had uh, the slave Haggai. She was part of the family. In fact, Abraham had a child with Haggai. So it was a little bit different than just what we call about chattel slavery. 
There are other circumstances in which a person can justly be compelled to servitude against one's will. For example, uh, prisoners of war or prisoners in jail. They can lose their freedom and be forced into some kind of servitude within certain limits. Also, people can sell their labor for a period of time. That's called indentured servitude or uh, indentured service. A form of that was serfs in the medieval days, and I'll come back to that in a few minutes. In the medieval days, the serfs, they would enter into a relationship with the king or lord, and they would live on and work the king or the lord's land. And when the harvest came, they would give an agreed-upon percentage to the lord or the king, and they would keep a little bit for themselves as caring for their family. And on the other side, the king and the lord had an obligation to the serf to take care and protect that serf and his family. So there's a big difference. But a lot of times what historians will do will morph one word into the other and then use it as a way of saying, see, the church didn't say this, didn't say it about this as a way of proving somehow that the church endorsed slavery. So these forms of servitude or slavery different in kind than what we are calling shadow slavery. Prisoners of war and criminals, they can lose their uh, freedom against their will, as a slave does, but they don't become property of their captor, even when their imprisonment is just. They still possess what? Basic human rights, inalienable rights, and they can't be subjected to certain forms of punishment like torture. Likewise, indentured servitude, they sell their labor, but they don't sell their inalienable rights. And they may not contract or be contracted to perform services that are immoral. And moreover, they freely agree to exchange their labor for some kind of benefit, transportation, food, lodging, etc., so their servitude is not involuntary, it's voluntary. And that's a true for serfdom. As I mentioned, I, you have to be clear about the term because people incorrectly conflate those kinds of servitude under the title of slavery, and it causes confusion, and it makes it very easy to attack the church. As I'll talk in a few minutes when we get to the Middle Ages, how people say, oh, well, all they did, the church did, was just change the word, slave to serf. Big, big difference. What is slavery? We talked about slavery. What is the history of slavery? Just briefly, shadow slavery, the type we're talking about, it's an ancient, ancient historical reality. In fact, historical records show that slavery is even older than the pyramids of Egypt. And it's been universal in every society that was sufficiently wealthy enough to afford it, including many aboriginal societies. You know, in our politically correct world, it's amazing when you read historians, how they extol the nobleness and the beauty of the people here in America. And boy, those people from Western civilization, they came over and destroyed this absolute primeval, paradisical like it was paradise. I have to say, oh, you mean those Aztecs that captured slaves and they took them up the ziggurat, the temple, and they carved their heart out and kicked their bodies down the uh, thing? Uh, those nice people? You know, it's amazing how they do this. The fact of the matter is, uh, American Indians in the Northwest had extensive slavery before the arrival of Columbus as did other Native American tribes. In fact, some of the Native American tribes actually, when the African slaves came, had African slaves, as did uh, the Native people of Mexico, Central America, and South America, and as we well know, in Africa. You know, the African trade, slave trade, happened because bigger tribes conquered smaller tribes and sold those people to the slave traders, whether it was the Western Europeans or, in many cases, a lot of it, to the Islamic leaders. And sadly, you know, we know that slavery even exists today. <clears throat> they may sound strange, but according to the U.S. State Department annual report, 
as many as 27 million people around the world are exploited in modern slavery, and most of them in Muslim countries and in Central Africa. So a slave is what? A human being who in the eyes of the law and custom is the possession or the shadow of another human being or a small group of people. Ownership of slave entails what? Absolute control. That slave has no rights, including this control, the right to punish and, if need be, to kill your slave, but that wouldn't be very profitable. And to direct their behavior in all things and to transfer even their ownership, sometimes even separating the families. The existence of slavery was a function of what? Human productivity. There will always be a demand for slaves when the average person can produce sufficient surplus so it becomes profitable for him to have slaves when the cost of maintaining and controlling the slave is offset by what? The profit that they bring through their production. Also, uh, this kind of slavery can exist as a form of consumption where sufficiently wealthy people, they use slaves in non-productive roles, personal servants, concubines or entertainers or even bodyguards. This kind of chattel consumeristic slavery is what's present in many Islamic societies. All early empires made the use of slave labor. Slave labor. But as the classical scholar M. I. Finley explained that the Greeks and the Romans, they achieved f truly the first slave societies, becoming highly dependent on large-scale employment of slave labor in both the countryside and in the cities. In fact, at the height of their empires, slaves probably outnumbered free citizens, both in Athens and in Rome. And there was no historical record, no historical record of anybody raising a voice about the horror of the evil of slavery. You know, all the secular world, I always get amazed, they did nothing, nothing to change or to criticize or condemn an institution of slavery. None of the secular world. The church, over a period of time, did, and I'll tell you how it did it. But it did it, but we're criticized because on day one, we didn't come out and say, this is evil. So we're nullified and they're the good guys. So did the church endure, endorse the institution of slavery? And is it true that the Catholic Church only repudiated slavery in the 1890s? Well, let's look at the history. And you gotta see the, the whole history of it. When the Catholic Church was born at the Feast of Pentecost, she was born into a world dominated by the Roman Empire. In fact, it was at its peak, absolute peak. And in this world, slavery was universally accepted as a social and an economic institution pertaining literally to the very structure of society. Just as today, the system of remunerated or paid employment is part of our whole society. It's just taken for granted. And just as in modern society, no one would possibly conceive seriously the abolition of a paid employment. Well. It didn't concur to anybody in the ancient world that uh, one would advocate the abolition of slaves. And that would be even true for the church. And a big reason for that is what? The early Christians, as witnessed by the early writings of St. Paul and other areas of the New Testament, what did they think? If you read St. Paul's early letters, what does he think? He believes the end of the world is coming right around the corner. Maybe a week, two weeks, maybe a month, maybe a year. They thought it was coming just around the corner. And you see that reflected in St. Paul's writings. So early Christians believed what? They believed it was their job to preach the gospel, as Jesus told them, to get people to become a believer in Jesus, to bring them to Jesus so that they could be saved before the end of the world would come. There was no real thought about changing the world with all its structure. They were only interested in changing people's hearts for the immediate coming of Jesus Christ. 
And that's why the early Christians more or less tolerated uh, chattel or uh, property slavery of their day, as reflected, as I said, in many parts or certain parts of the New Testament. But later on, as the church begins to grow and mature, when she realizes that Jesus Christ is not coming back in the next year or in the short period of time in the future, well, she realized that she was going to take a long, hard journey through history, and she began to reflect on the gospel and her responsibility in the world to do what? To transform the world and all its institutions. How? Literally from the inside out. So it, it, it took time and it took freedom for the church to begin to reflect on the gospel message as it applied uh, to the world around her. You know, when you're under persecution, as the early church did, you don't have time to think about theological questions. You're just trying to keep your soul in decent enough shape so if they capture you and they execute you, you can go to heaven. You don't see a, a whole lot of things. It's only when what happens... Remember, at the Edict of Milan, 313, Constantine passed this edict. He gave Christianity legal status for the first time in the Roman world. And with that legal status, they had the freedom to practice their faith. Literally, underground in the catacombs, now they come forward into society, and they begin to mix with society. And as they go and mix with the pagan society, what happens? As they preach the gospel, people start asking questions of the gospel. And that's what we call theological reflection or the development of theology. And that's what began to happen. The church began to reflect on a lot of things. This theological reflection, I said, came at the time of the passing of the Edict of Milan. See, the Catholic Church, if you study history, it didn't articulate certain aspects of faith or doctrine of faith until after the Edict of Milan. As the church began to reflect on the truths as it interacted with the world, it began to go its understanding. And that's a concept called the development of doctrine. That doesn't mean the church makes up truths. It doesn't make up truths. It rather reflects on it and it begins to deepen its understanding. Kind of an organic thing. The seed that has all the potential bursts forth in new life and it creates a greater entity, a plant. Huh? But there's a, there's a development, a connection to this. You know, like you hear sometimes uh, you'll be challenged to say, well, how could you teach that the Pope is infallible? It was only defined in 1870. What a stupid religion. You just make it up, pull it out of thin air, like kind of a, a magician pulling something out of a hat? No. The church had always believed in infallibility. It's only when it was being challenged in a world or confused that the church will articulate it. So as the world went out, as a church went out into the world and they started preaching Christ, that Jesus Christ is Lord, the questions came back to them, well, when was he Lord? Was he Lord at his birth or was it at his baptism? Did it happen at his death? No, 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 no. He was the eternal word. Remember when the church defined that Jesus Christ was God? Do you remember what year it was? It was 325 A.D. at the Council of Nicaea. Now, for 325 years or 300 some plus years, did the church not believe that truth? No. It believed it. But as the questions came to it, it began to articulate clearly Jesus Christ is true God. And then further reflection later on at the Council of Chalcedon in the year 451, He's, he's true God, one divine person and two natures intimately connected. That divine mystery, the consubstantiality. But these are all these questions that came up because it was interacting with the world. It wasn't the church just started believing that Jesus was Lord at 325 or that he was one divine person with two natures in 451, but the articulation came to clarify for the world what we believe. Other questions, for example, how many books are in the Bible and what books were in the Bible? That didn't happen until about the year 391. We didn't have a Bible until 391? No, no, there was, there was the books that were treasured, but the question is, well, which ones are in and which ones are out? Because there was all kinds of writings and the church would gather and reflect upon it. 
And the criterion was established, and so you came up with 46 in the old and 27 in the new. That happened at, in the year 391 AD and reconfirmed throughout history. Fully articulated when Martin Luther challenged it and said, no, it's not that. It's only 39 in the old and 27 in the new. The church we said, no, it's always been 46 and 27. So these questions you see come up as you go through history. Sacraments. What's a sacrament? How many are sacraments? How do you define a sacrament? One time, they said there was 14 sacraments in a loose definition. Eventually, they said, no, no, no. It's much more specific than just being a sacramental, holy water. Sacrament's different. And it came up with the seven as they reflected upon what Jesus gave them. So the, uh, the church, as it grew, it began to ponder, not just on its doctrine of faith, but on the moral issues as they faced them, namely, as we're talking tonight, about slavery. So the early church more or less tolerated slavery of their day, as we see reflected in the early writings of St. Paul. And the fact that after Christianity became the religion of the Roman Empire, in the beginning of the 400s and stuff, slavery was not immediately outlawed. Again, it takes time to reflect about what this is, how does, it, how does it work? But even if that's true, this doesn't mean that Christianity was compatible with Roman slavery or that the church did not contribute to its demise. In that regard, there's a number of very important points to be kept in mind. First, while St. Paul told slaves to obey their master, and that's what you hear the second one, look at he says, well, obey your master, he's approving slavery. No. Remember, he was talking about the context that the world was going to end. Be as good as you can and where you're at so you can get to be home in heaven. That's the basic thing. But he told them to obey their masters. He didn't make a general defense of slavery any more than he made a general defense of the pagan government of Rome, which Christians, he instructed them also to obey, despite a lot of the injustices in the, in the government. St. Paul seems simply to have regarded slavery as an intractable part of the social order, an order that he thought was going to come to an end in the very near future. It's all coming to an end. You don't waste a lot of time on it, huh? Second, St. Paul told the masters to treat their slaves justly and kindly, implying that slaves are not just mere property for the master to do what they please. Third, Paul implied that the brotherhood shared by Christians is ultimately incompatible with chattel slavery. And we see that reflected in the case of the letter of St. Paul to Philemon. It was a case of a runaway slave. He had run away from his master. And, and technically, in the Roman day, the day of St. Paul, if that happened, you kill the slave. Because you don't want the rest of your slaves to go. Get rid of the bad one, you know. I, my mom grew up in a cattle ranch and... Uh, uh, once a cow learns how to get through the barbed wire, he starts teaching the other ones. So you, you get rid of them. Send them to McDonald's for a little hamburger. You don't keep them around because he teaches bad habits to the other cattle. I didn't believe that, but they do. So that's, that was the, the going. That was what was done in those days. But Paul wrote, writes to Philemon, the slave master, instructing him to do what? Not only receive Onesimus back, not as a slave, but as a brother. You find that in Philemon 6. With respect to salvation in Christ, later on you hear him in Ephesians 3, 27, 28, that in Christ there is neither what? Neither slave or free. You are all one in Christ. Fourth, the Christian principles of charity, love your neighbor as yourself, and the golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. These were espoused in the New Testament. And in times the church began to reflect, they say, wait a minute, the very heart of our faith, of God, of mercy and love, it's totally incompatible with chattel slavery. Even if, because of its deeply established role as a social institution, even if it was there, it's incompatible. That was a point that began to become very clear as we reflect upon uh, the reality of the world, the gospel, as it interacts 
and the institutions we face. Now, people sometimes say, well, that just nullifies it. Really? You know, the church often speaks on things in society, huh? And how well does our, uh, our, our, our secular world respond? Oh, perfect obedience, right? I mean, how many people we say this is wrong and they still do it? We say abortion is wrong. But it's legal, isn't it? And we're supposed to be enlightened people. You see, a lot of people don't see things in the context of development of, the, of history and how we grow and understand. Fifth, while the Christian empire didn't immediately uh, outlaw slavery, you can read the church fathers, those theologians that wrote from the first century to the sixth century, we call them the church fathers. You know, they renounced slavery, denounced it. People like St. Gregory Nyssa and St. John Chrysostom But then, even though they denounced it, oftentimes those guys were exiled by the secular state, the leaders. And they certainly were persecuted. They didn't listen to them. And as I mentioned before, that happens still today. The church speaks very clearly how we should behave. You should go to Mass every Sunday. Third commandment. And you know what? About one quarter of the people come to Mass on Sunday. You see, so you have to see this. Six, some early Christians, they liberated their slaves. While some churches, they literally redeemed slaves uh, by ransoming them. In fact, some Christians in the early church literally took the place of a slave. Traded themselves for that slave so that slave could be free. St. Francis was going to do that. Some of the other saints were willing to go to the Muslim countries to trade themselves in and free of slave, a Christian slave. Seventh, even where slavery was not altogether repudiated, slaves and freemen had equal access to the sacraments, and many clergy came from the slave background. In fact, two of our popes, Pope Pius I and Pope Callistus, they were both former slaves. And the unique thing about Christianity was that blew away the secular Roman world was the fact that slaves and free had equal status in the church. Eighth, the church ameliorated the harsher aspects of slavery in the empire, even trying to protect slaves by law until slavery disappeared in the West. And you see this process little by little as the church gets traction in the world and gets a foot and a voice in society. It begins to bring the gospel to bear and little by little it begins to challenge this horrific institution. Of course, you know, if you study history, slavery which was kind of eliminated by the 10th century, as we'll hear in a few moments, it was resurrected during the Renaissance period as what? As the Europeans encountered the Muslim slave traders and the indigenous people of the Americas a little later on with the founding of the New World. So during the Roman Empire, the church basically coexisted with the reality of slavery. But all the while, as it's reflecting, the tension between the support of this reality of slavery and the emphasis on the equality of all in the eyes of God, the tension began to grow. And with the demise of the Roman Empire, what did the do? The church do? It began to extend and embrace to those in slavery, giving them all the rights of the church. One thing they didn't at that time, they didn't, they were denied only ordination to the priesthood. The historian Pierre Bonacier expressed the matter as well as anyone. He said this, a slave was baptized and has a soul. He was then unambiguously a man. And with slaves recognized as human beings, well, then what happened? The priest, the church began to urge owners to free their slaves as the infinitely commendable act. And to ins- for what reason? To ensure your own salvation. And there's many, many records of wills that were written where they practice manumission, which means freeing the slave. Slavery began to decline uh, in the latter days of the Roman Empire. For what reason? Certainly the influence of the church, but also if you study history, Rome begins to crumble. 
It begins to crumble specifically because of the slave labor they employed. It's what happened. They were no longer going out because people now had everything done to the, before them by slaves. By the way, you read a wonderful book called uh, How the West Won by Rodney Starks. And I was just shocked when I read it. He had a chapter called The Roman Interlude. He said Rome was not a great empire. It was a great military empire, and it conquered a lot of people, and it adopted and brought back from them all their creativity, all their ingenuity. Basically, Rome borrowed everything from Greece and just put a Roman name to it or a Latin name to it. But they really didn't. The only thing that Romans invented is a pretty good thing. They invented cement. But outside of that, it was all borrowed from other people. And their undoing was they had everybody doing everything, the slaves. So there was no creativity, no ingenuity. And one of the things is that economics will also play a part in, in the issue of slavery itself, in the bigger picture. So as the Roman Empire begins to decline because of the uh, lack of the military power, it starts to decline in Rome. They don't go out on these big campaigns. They don't bring back a lot of slaves. Also, the fertility rate among the Roman slaves was very, very low. There was few women slaves, and malnutrition uh, really didn't produce any offspring hardly at all. So you would think, okay, it's beginning to falter now, but what happened? If you remember in history, as Rome falls, the, the new people, the barbarians from the north, the uh, Germanic kingdoms, they come down and start their campaigns. And once again, the slave trade is resurrected. It produces a whole new source of slaves. Although no one really knows how many slaves were in Europe during the 6th century, they seem to be incredibly plentiful. And the treatment that they did to their slaves was far, far harsher than the Romans. In the legal codes of the various Germanic groups that ruled in the place where Rome had once been, slaves were equated... They were not even human. They were treated as livestock, literally. Nevertheless, despite that, what's happening? The church is beginning to make its inroads to its missionary activity. See, most of the uh, uh, Germanic tribes, they were pagan. So it took some time for the church to get in to evangelize with the gospel. But the doctrines of the church, that slaves were human and not chattel, they also had another really remarkable implication. They were human beings and they were members of the church. What had began to happen? They began to intermarry. Okay, they intermarried. And that begins to bring down the, the, the wall between free and slave. In fact, one of the most celebrated unions took place in 649 AD when Clovis II, the king of the Franks, he married his British slave, Bathilda. And when Clovis died in the year 757, Bethilda did what? She ruled as the regent, the queen, until her son could grow up to become the king. And she used her position in an extraordinary way to mount a campaign to do what? To halt slave trade and to redeem those in slavery. And upon her death, the church has since canonized her. But she was a slave. But through the intermarriage, things began to break down. At the end of the 8th century, Charlemagne vehemently opposed slavery. He was a Catholic uh, emperor, huh? Not only him, but all the popes and many other powerful clerical voices all condemned slavery. In the 9th century, Bishop Agobard of Lyon thundered, All men are brothers. All invoke the one same Father, God. The slave and the master, the poor and the rich man, the ignorant and the learned, the weak and the strong, none has been raised above the other. There is no slave or free, but all in all things and always there's only one Christ. At the very same time, Abbot Smagard of San Miguel wrote a work dedicated to the Emperor Charlemagne. He said, Most merciful king, forbid that there should be any slave in your kingdom. Soon no one doubted that slavery itself was a divine law. That's the 8th century. So you see the church getting a foot into society, bringing to bear the gospel upon the institution of society, and beginning to change this horrific institution. During the 11th century, both St. Wolfstein and St. Anselm, 
they campaigned vigorously to remove all vestiges of slavery in Christendom. And according to the historian Mark Bloch, no man, no real Christian at any rate, could thereafter legitimately be held as the property of another. Now, I mentioned earlier when I was talking about definition of slavery. There are many historians that insist that, there, that slavery never came to an end. There was medieval slavery. That nothing happened other than a linguistic shift from the word slave to the word serf. But you know, they are being disingenuous. They're playing word games. Because serfs were not shadow slaves. They had significant rights and substantial de degree of discretion in their life. So they said they would make a, basically a contract with their lord or their king to live on the land, to produce, to make the land produce. They give a, a large potion to the king or the lord and they keep some for themselves. But in turn, the lord had to abide by the agreements. They had to protect them and care for them. They had to... Uh, they were allowed to marry. They couldn't separate families. All the things went on with the, the uh, other kinds of shadow slavery. They were forbidden. They married whom they wished, and their families were not subject to sale or dispersal. They paid rent and thus controlled their own time and their pace of work. In some places, the serfs owed their lord a number of days of labor each year, but the obligation was limited, more similar to what we consider now hired hands, huh? You couldn't work them on Sunday. See, although the serfs were bound to a lord by extensive obligation, also the lord was bound to them by extensive obligation. No one, in you see, would argue that the medieval serfs or peasants were uh, slaves in the modern sense. They were free. The brutal institution of slavery essentially disappeared in Europe about the 10th century. Now, Almost every historian agrees with this conclusion, but it remains incredibly fashionable to deny that the Catholic Church had anything to do with it. Let me quote a few of these historians. Robert Fossier. The progressive elimination of slavery was in no way the work of Christian people. The, pre, the, the church preached resignation, promised equality in the hereafter, and felt no compunction about keeping large herds of animals with human faces. Another historian, George Duby, he dismissed any church role in ending slavery, saying Christianity did not condemn slavery. It dealt it barely a glancing blow. Where are these people coming from? Well, according to these historians, slavery disappeared because it became unprofitable, an outdated mode of production. Even the Yale scholar Robert Lopez, he accepted this view, claiming that slavery only ended when technological progress, such as the water wheel, made slaves useless or unproductive. So in this view, from that perspective, and you hear a lot of that, and it's, it's propagated through our, our public school system, the end of slavery was not a moral decision, but one of self-interest on the part of the elite. By the way, that same argument is used concerning the abolition of slavery in the Western Hemisphere. See, both those claims, you see, are consistent with what? Marxism, Marxism doctrine. But they're quite inconsistent with true economic realities. Even as late as the start of the Civil War, as we know here in this nation, Southern slavery remained a profitable mode of production. It was very profitable. Because the fact of the matter is, slavery pays if you can get more out of your slave than it costs for you to keep them, to care for them, to control them. If the profit is more, it's worthwhile. But it's, that is true. But what's equally true is that slaves are not nearly as productive as self-interested individuals performing the same task in pursuit of their own economic goals and interests. That is this. The owners benefit from the possession of slaves, but societies benefit far more from a free workforce. If you go back to ancient Rome, I alluded to the fact that Rome had a huge slave population. It did everything. Rome had a far stronger economy and army before the small independent farmers 
all around in the, uh, the countryside around Rome before they were bought out, pushed out by the slave-based estates. The super elite of Rome had assumed all the power. That's why politically I'm a small government man because you study history and you see once the government assumes all power, they take over all things and all forms of production. And that's what happened in Rome. Small elite, the small group of senators, a few other wealthy times, they, they bought up all these farms. And the independence farmers, where'd they go? They didn't have a place to go because the farms were being worked by slaves. They came to the city. Now the government has a big problem because it's got to support all these other people. So you get into the bread and the circuses, and what's it do? It bankrupt Rome. And that's how it fell. But there was far more production when you have ownership of something. And you're working it, and you're making your own profit. That's why Greece succeeded, because they had city-states, and people had ownership in their, prop uh, their property. And they were willing to work long hours because they were getting something out of it. And they were willing to fight for it because it was theirs. But once that begins to break down through slavery, everything kind of folds. Consequently, overcoming slavery gave Europe an incredible advantage over the rest of the world. That's why Western civilization became literally the, uh, the, uh, the place where all creativity flowed from. It's because it learned that uh, overcoming slavery gave it an economic uh, advantage over the rest of the world. But economics were not the decisive factor. Slavery ended in medieval Europe and the hereafter only because of the influence and the teaching of the Catholic Church. And after centuries of this European decline, what happened? If you know your history, it once again would erupt. It erupted through the Islamic culture, who took slaves all the time. In fact, if you study history, the Battle of Oponto, one of the greatest famous sea battles, it was won by the Christians who were greatly outnumbered. The Ottoman Turks had the elite navy, outnumbered the Christians in a great way. But how the Christians won? Because they got on a ship, and they took over one ship, and the ship was filled with what? Christian slaves. Islam had imprisoned over a million Christians from Europe in all kinds of things, but they were the ones that were rowing the galleys. And every time they freed the ship, more got on their side, and they literally overwhelmed the other side, even though they were outnumbered. But the other things we know is the discovery of the New World, Spain and Portugal in particular. There was a huge resurrection of slavery again. It became a matter of great commerce to seize native people and carry them off to work on the plantations and the mines or elsewhere. Literally, slave trade became a worldwide industry with the sources for that brutal business founded in Africa and in the Americas itself. But the church continued to condemn the practice, even though some countries or peoples weren't listening. Okay. The Pope would issue a papal bull, but if you study history in the 15th century, the 16th century, the government, even though it was somewhat Catholic, they didn't allow the papal bull to get in there to be pronounced. They controlled everything. The church, uh, the government chose the bishops, the people that would be kind to them and nice to them. That was one of the problems the church got into because it, the government was stacking the church full of people that agreed with the government. So the church can speak, but the question is, will the people listen and will the countries listen? But let me tell you the ways the church spoke. Sixty years before Columbus discovered the New World, Pope Eugene IV condemned the enslavement of people in the newly colonized Canary Islands. He issued a papal bull called Sicut Ducum, and he rebuked European enslavers and commanded that all in each of the faithful of each sex, within the space of 15 days of the publication of this papal bull in the place where they lived, that they were to restore, be restored to their earlier liberty. The Canary Islands who have been made subject to slavery. These people are to be totally and perpetually free and are to be let go without the exaction or reception of any money. A century later, in 1537, Pope Paul III applied the same principle 
to the newly encountered inhabitants of the West and South Indies. He issued a papal bull called Sublimis Deus in 1537. In response to the common enslavement of the Indians and the ruthless seizing of their territory, he excommunicated those people who took part in the slave trade among the Native Americans. He described that enslavers are allies of the devil and declared all attempts to justify such slavery null and void. And accompanying that papal bull was another document, Pastorolia Officionum, which attached what? A laetitia, uh, la laetitia sententiae excommunicatione. That's the big ex excommunication. You have to go all the way to Rome to get that lifted. For anybody that would enslave the Native Americans or steal their property or their goods. The Jesuits in the Americas were feared and hated by the Spanish government and the Portuguese government because of their efforts to do what? To protect the rights of the native people. How many people saw that beautiful movie? It was back 20 years ago, The Mission. Did anybody see that? The story of the Jesuits that evangelized these indigenous natives of uh, kind of, it was in Bolivia, Brazil area. It's a magnificent movie. But the Jesuits are undone by the government literally had them suppressed, and they were also suppressed in Europe. Pope Urban VIII in 1639 condemned all forms of slavery, and it was common practice for popes and for some Christian princes and prelates to do what? Give their own money to per, uh, for the purpose, purchase of galley slaves to free them from their servitude. When the Europeans began enslaving the Africans as a cheap source of labor, the Holy Office of the Inquisition was asked about the morality of enslaving innocent blacks. The practice was rejected, as was the trading of such slaves. Slave owners, according to the Holy Office, declared were ob obliged to emancipate and compensate the blacks unjustly slave. So a lot of times you hear uh, uh, people will say, like historians, uh, that, oh, the church did nothing to ameliorate anything. That's not true. The church had what they called these black codes, slave codes. For example, in France in 1685. And what, what did that do? It did not, uh, it said they, that slaves couldn't gather in a public gathering, they couldn't have guns, okay. But on the other side of it, the owners were mandated to baptize, to catechize their slaves, to permit them to marry. They couldn't work on Sunday. They couldn't be tortured. They couldn't be served. There were very strong restrictions. Now, how many listened to it? But the fact of the matter is, where the Christian countries were, at least these codes were beginning the whole change of the attitude. In the Protestant ones, it was just the opposite. It was as horrific as, as the ancient times for these people. So when historians say, oh, the church did nothing. It did as best it could in the reality. Like we live in a reality where abortion is a legal right. We're working with all our effort, with all our intensity and all our prayer and mercy to save kids and to try to turn that thing around. But it's, it's a long, hard slog. Doesn't mean we don't believe it because it hasn't changed. It's just you got to keep working at things to change people's hearts. In the 19th century, uh, it was a particularly active period for the church against slave trade. Pope Gregory the, uh, the uh, uh, excuse me, Pope Gregory the sixth in 1838 wrote to the bishops of Brazil to commend them on having at long last outlawed slavery. That same pope in 1839 issued a papal bull in Supremo. He reiterated again the papal opposition to enslaving Indians, blacks, or other such people and he forbade any ecclesiastic or lay person from presuming to defend as permissible this trade in black slaves, no matter what the pretext or excuse. In 1888 and 1890, Pope Leo XIII forcefully condemned slavery and brought it its elimination where it persisted in still parts of South America and Africa. Of lasting importance, the founding of the Anti-Slavery League in France by Cardinal Le Viguerier in 1890, he had a congregation called the White Fathers, the Missionaries of Africa. It labored long and hard and still does to end the practice of slavery. Now, some critics try to dismiss the church's role in uh, abolishing slavery by pointing to the fact that here in America, there were some bishops and some clergy uh, and some theologians who tried to defend the American slave system. Remember, we can be as corrupt 
and get corrupted by our society. But those few bishops and priests and theologians, what they were trying to do, they were trying to contend that the long-standing standing papal condemnation of slavery, it didn't first apply to the United States. Not true. Then they said, well, the slave trade, uh, it was condemned by Pope Gregory, but not slavery itself. They were, what were they doing? Mincing words, huh? The fact of the matter is the papal teaching consistently taught that slave trade and shadow slavery is evil. So, yes, certain members of the American hierarchy at the time tried to explain it away. According to Father uh, Panzer, we can look to this practice of non-compliance with the teachings of the papal magisterium as a key reason why slavery was not a directly opposed in the United States by the church. Other reasons were, if you remember in your history, there was a great anti-Catholic sentiment in the early times of the church, uh, early part of the, this nation. It persisted well into the 1800s. Uh, terrible. Have you remember the native, native, nativist movement? Convents were raided because they were said that they were houses of prostitution. and uh, These things went on regularly. Churches were burned on a regular basis, Catholic churches. This kind of thing was going on. So sometimes the church lay low, and you can criticize people for not courage at times. But the fact of the matter is just because the church has said something. It doesn't mean it becomes a reality. The Second Vatican Council continued the consistent teaching of the church in condemning shadow slavery. It writes, whatever insults human dignity, such as subhuman living conditions, arbitrary imprisonment, deportation, slavery, the selling of women and children, as well as the disgraceful working conditions where men are treated as mere tools for profit, rather than as free and responsible persons, all these things and others of their like are infamies indeed. They are a supreme dishonor to the Creator. Unfortunately, what Vatican II said about slavery is of little interest to the opponents of Catholicism, insofar as they think it's only useful then to uh, demonstrate what they call Catholic hypocrisy. So when critics try to dismiss the authenticity of the church's teaching, the fact of the matter is uh, they do so from ignorance, prejudice, and a desire to discredit the church. The truth is, the church was responsible. It took time, as we're taking time now to change a lot of immorality in our nation. It takes time to repudiate and to abolish evil institutions. She's constantly speaking and condemning the evils of the world. Sadly, still, a lot of people don't listen. So for the sake of the world to say the early church approved and supported slavery and didn't get around to repudiating it until 1890s, well, it's just a myth and a lie. And that takes me to the second myth of today, tonight, and that's this. The Catholic Church is obsessed with sex, is anti-sex. Boy, the secular world is constantly espousing that myth, that the church is obsessed with sex, or variations of the myths. The church is hung up about sex, or is uptight about sex, or is anti-sex. Brothers and sisters, hear this very clearly. The truth is the Catholic Church and Catholics aren't the ones obsessed with sex. It's the secular media and the, and the modern progressives that are obsess obsessed about sex. For them, it's non-stop sex. You can't open a magazine, a newspaper, watch a television program, a TV commercial, a movie, or listen to some radio program without sex being thrown in somewhere. You know, 10 years ago, I was pastor down at Holy Family in Glendale, and it's not too far from DreamWorks, and I would be invited up as the pastor to... Uh, go there and, and to talk to the people about some project they were going to do. But I was sitting down with a vice president of DreamWorks, and I turned to him and I said, can I ask you a question? What happened to all the wonderful storytellers that Hollywood used to have that told really good stories? It seems to me that a great majority of your movies are simply remakes of good old stories and made bad in the remake. Or they are so poorly made that they're all just a conflation or a connecting of all kinds of fast chase scenes 
super violence, and then, yes, you better be, see, be sure, out of the clear blue sky for no reason whatsoever, whammo, a super erotic scene comes blasting across the stage and across the, uh, the, uh, the, the screen. I said, you know what that reminds me of, sir? I said, it reminds me of an old story I heard about a pastor who, after the Mass, sent the altar boy out to the pulpit to get his sermon. And the altar boy went up to the pulpit, and there was pages of the sermon, all neatly typed, a little underlined here and there. But on the edge of one of the pages, there was a handwritten note, and the little boy looked at it and said, Logic is weak here. Shout like hell. Well, brothers and sisters, that's what so much of the media does. The logic, the storytelling, it's so weak that what do they do? They shout like hell to distract people or to divert their attention or to grab their attention. You know, our beloved Holy Father, Pope John Paul II, now St. John Paul II, when he came to California in 1987, how many remember his papal visit here? It's a wonderful visit. What a lot of people missed is that one of the gatherings was a gathering of all the people in the entertainment industry. And I'll just sum up basically what he said. He told them that their business and their art form, which he himself loved, he was a playwright. He was an actor. He loved their medium. But he said that their business and their art form could do so much to build up people and the society with noble stories or Their business could tear down people by appealing to the base nature of the human person. And he urged them to do the former. Unfortunately, they did the latter. You know, another point on this. Have you ever noticed that the secular world, the unbelieving world, it loves the Catholic Church when it comes to all things social justice? What do I mean by that? They applaud us. They cheer us when we care for the sick and the poor. When you educate people with no expense to the society through our Catholic school system, we educate people. We educate the poor. I remember uh, uh, Cardinal uh, O'Connor in New York. God bless his soul. What a wonderful bishop there. But, you know, all the public schools are complaining. Well, we can't educate these people because of the breakdown of the family, and we have all these disadvantages. The Catholic Church gets the select students. You know what Cardinal Connor did? He called them on it. You give me your 10% worse students, and I guarantee you, I'll put them in my Catholic school, and I guarantee you, I will have them up to code, up to the level of reading. I'll have them good students. Because we know how to educate. And the world cheers us when we do that. It cheers us when we talk about fighting for the poor and especially basic human rights, fighting against human trafficking, issues of immigration, the environment, the economy, war. It cheers us. But that same secular world absolutely goes unhinged when it comes to the church's belief and teaching about one topic, sex. And all the issues connected to sex. What do I mean by that? Where does the Catholic Church get attacked? On its teaching for of birth control, premarital sex, cohabitation, extramarital sex, homosexual sex, gay marriage, abortion, in vitro fertilization, and surrogate motherhood. In this one area and its satellites around it, this one area, the secularists go get unhinged and they accuse the Catholic Church of these words. You hear it all the time. They're backwards, medieval, repressive, archaic, out of touch with the mainstream America. Let me give you a few examples about that. When the American bishops not too long ago spoke out sharply against the epidemic of pornography, a recent headline in the paper grumbled this way. Why are the Catholic bishops so obsessed with pelvic issues? Another incident, I don't know if you picked this up in the news about three weeks ago, involved a recent BBC production which highlighted the correspondence of Pope John Paul II, Saint Pope John Paul II, and a lovely woman named Anna Teresa uh, Timinika. She was a fellow Polish philosopher and a woman friend. 
The BBB, BBC production said they had discovered secret letters between Pope John Paul II and this beautiful uh, Polish woman, implying that there was something untoward, sinful in the relationship. The fact of the matter is the Pope's relationship and friendship with this woman was neither secret nor extraordinary. He had many dear friendships. You know, one of the first things, I, if I remember correctly, what he did when he got named Pope, his dearest childhood friend was a Jewish family and a Jewish boy, and his parents had died in the, in the horrible uh, Holocaust. He had commissioned a beautiful headstone for the village from which he came, given to the family at his expense. He had many beautiful, deep friends with men and women. They just had a beautiful, wonderful friendship reflected in those letters. But the secular progressives of the world, they can't conceive of someone having a beautiful friendship with another person that isn't sexual. That's what's going on. And of course, I don't need to mention uh, how the media reacts to our current Holy Father, Pope Francis, and his remarks to the media. I don't remember uh, about a year and a year or some ago, the Pope was at World Youth Day in Brazil. And on his way home, do you remember this incident? He was asked about an incident. Well, the incident was that a priest that he knew was accused of being involved in some homosexual activity. That was the presenting issue. And he had appointed him to a certain position. And the Pope's response was basically, who am I to judge a person who's trying to be a disciple of Jesus? In other words, he was talking about people can make mistakes, do the wrong thing, but they can repent as well. What did the media do? It ran with it saying the Pope was now endorsing homosexual sex and gay marriage. That's what the secular world does. The point I'm making with some of these examples is this. The, se the secular world obsessively views so much of life through the lens of sex. When he hears a view different from what it believes and it lives, it gets enraged and unhinged. And it races off with some statements that they didn't, uh, it races off with some statement that didn't understand. And they try to use it to literally to promote uh, literally their agenda. That's what's happening. Excuse me. So, who's the one who's obsessed with sex? Brothers and sisters, it's not the Catholic Church. I'll tell you what the Catholic Church is obsessed with. She's obsessed with God. She's obsessed with the plan and the will of God. She's obsessed with God's love as it applies to us as humans. You see, by natural law and God's revelation, the Catholic Church knows that God created everything for a plan and a purpose. And when we use that thing according to its godly purpose, it becomes useful, beneficial, and a blessing. But when we don't use something for its proper purpose, guess what? It breaks. Much as you will break a pencil if you use it to try to open a can. It's not the purpose of a pencil. So the church is passionate about sex. Why? Because it's passionate about God's plan, God's purpose for sex. He's not unclear about it. He's very clear. In the book of Genesis and all through the scripture and all through the tradition of our faith, but from the very beginning, when God was creating everything, we read about God's intention, huh? Genesis 1, 27, 28. God created man in his image. In the divine image, he created him. Male and female, he created him, them. And God blessed them, saying, be fertile and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and all the living things that move on the earth. Genesis 2, 19 to 25. And then the Lord God built up into a woman the rib that he had taken from the man. And when he brought her to the man, the man said, This one at last is bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. This one shall be called woman, for out of her man she has been taken. And that is why a man loves, leaves his father and mother and clings to his wife. And the two of them become one body. You see, in these two passages, 
we hear what? The two essential goals or purposes of marriage and marital love. The unitive, this is why a man leaves his father and mother and clings to his wife, and the two of them become one, the unitive goal. And then the procreative goal, procreation. God created him in his image and likeness. God blessed them, saying, be fertile and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. So from natural law, seeing how things just work naturally as they observe the world around us, and from divine revelation, the Catholic Church knows that God designed sex for a man and a woman in a committed, for the rest of your life covenant, one that is forever faithful, permanent, and life-giving, not just to each spouse, that's a unitive, but also to have children to be raised in the environment, in that home where they experience literally the embrace of God through the embrace of a mom and dad. And when a husband and wife in marriage share the gift of sexuality with each other, keeping those two purposes together in the sexual act, do you know what the church teaches, brothers and sisters? It teaches that it is a prayer. It sanctifies the couple. Isn't that incredible? Isn't that beautiful? You make holy your spouse to the selfless gift of all that you are as you wash dishes and clothes and do all that stuff and take care of kids. But it all culminates in that beautiful act where one gives one, uh, themselves to the other. It is literally a prayer. You sanctify each other. Is that far different than the view of our world that treats it just as some kind of animalistic act? When sex is shared Outside that vision, without those two goals or purposes, the church says it's wrong, it's sinful, it breaks. You know, when I was, uh, as an associate, I was in charge of the youth ministry, and a lot of the youth would come up to me, you know, the guys especially, you know, Father, I mean, why is it wrong for me to have sex with my girlfriend? And sometimes a girl would say my boyfriend. You know, we love each other. We care about each other. We're not hurting anyone. What could be so wrong that feels uh, so good. Well, I tell them that, uh, look, you don't determine whether something is good or bad, right or wrong, just by looking at it or how it feels. You determine something's right or wrong, good or bad, by asking the fundamental question, what's the purpose of it? If it fulfills the purpose, then it's good. If it doesn't, then it's bad. I'll give you an example. This wristwatch. Is this watch good or bad? Well, what's the fundamental question? Does it tell time? Yeah. If it, yeah, I think I'm, I'm on target. I got 50 more minutes. If, it's, if it tells time, then it, it's good. If it doesn't, then it's bad. You discard it or you get it fixed. Another way of looking at it is body language. You're referencing Pope John Paul II's beautiful uh, theology, the body. As humans, what are we? We are embodied souls. Our soul expresses itself through the incarnational reality of our bodies. Our soul has body language. You know, we know when someone's mad at us, and we know it because of the body language. You know, they turn their back on us, down or, you know. There's a body language. Or there's a silent treatment, huh? You know, you heard the expression, you you can't trust that person because he lies through his teeth. Well, when sex is misused, what are you doing? You're lying through your whole body. You're doing something that is not according to the purpose and plan of God. The church knows the plan and purpose of everything. That's why she speaks with God authority about the morality of everything, whether it's personal behavior or the economy or business dealings or the environment or people's human rights, the protection of the poor and the most vulnerable in our society. Again, the secular world shares that part of it. We're really correct in all that. We're infallible in all that. But when the church speaks about the same divine authority, about the gift of sexuality as purpose, a purpose she knows so well, the world goes crazy and attacks the church as being out of touch and unreal. Brothers and sisters, the Catholic Church is the one institution that is most in touch with reality and the one that is most real and the one who tells the truth about sex. You know, I often tell people, you know, I, when they ask me, where were you born? I said, well, I was born in Van Nuys, California. But you know, I, even though I was born in Van Nuys, California, when it comes to 
uh, telling the truth about things. I'm a man from Missouri. In Missouri, the nickname is, it's the show me state, huh? So when it comes to statistical evidence and observing things, I'm a man from Missouri. Let's see who's telling the truth about sex. The church or the world? If the world is right about sex, namely that there should be no limits to sex, that one should be able to do what one feels or desires, that one should be able to have sex with anyone a person wants, that there's nothing wrong or harmful about sex, no matter how it's shared and with whom it's shared, then, brothers and sisters, we should see the obvious evidence of that truth. People should be happier, marriages should be stronger, families should be holding together, more united, the world should be more peaceful. Brothers and sisters, honestly, I don't see it. I don't see it. I don't think you see it. It's just the opposite. But if the church is right, as I believe with my every fiber in my being, then we should see the evidence. And brothers and sisters, the evidence is there. It's the communion of saints. It's the so many wonderful, fabulous marriages that have served as the building block of the church and the kingdom of God. So when the secular world says the church is obsessed with sex, I say, it's more accurate to say, we're not obsessed with sex. We're obsessed with true love, true life, and finding the eternal beauty of God himself that God has revealed through all of Revelation, the scripture and tradition. And we see it. Remember St. Paul's words, those cogent words in 1 Corinthians 6? The body is not for immorality, but it's for the Lord. Your bodies belong to Christ. Avoid all immorality. Your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. So glorify your, the Lord in your body. Listen to that. That biblical teaching on sexual morality, it's so positive, it's so liberating, so healthy, so happy and wholesome. As the Bible reveals, and as St. Paul elaborates, as philosophers and poets and sage men and wise women of the past and present remind us, as our own experience tells us, as the ingrained promptings of the natural law nudge us, and as a church constantly in our tradition passes on to us, sexual love is so sacred, so noble, so awesome, that it actually reflects what? God's personal, passionate love for us. If you ever go to the Prado in Spain, the beautiful museum of art there, Murillo has a magnificent painting there. It's called The Double Trinity. It's a beautiful painting. It shows God the Father, the Holy Spirit, and the child Jesus here, flanked by Mary and Joseph. And the way he arranges the figures They form two triangles, a double trinity. But the point is obvious. You see, what goes on in heaven, as we pray in the Our Father, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. What's going on in heaven? The Father loves the Son so perfectly, so completely, so divinely. And the Son returns that love so perfectly, so divinely. Their union is so perfect It's the thirdness of the Trinity, the third person, the Holy Spirit. And that's reflected what? In marriage. As the husband loves the wife and the wife loves the husband so generously, so generously, so perfectly, so divinely. The thirdness is what? It's children. See, it's reflected in that. So human sexual love should have the same traits as divine love. That means it is forever, it's faithful, it's life-giving. <clears throat> so the creator intends that sexual love does what? It takes place only within the lifelong, creative, exclusive, loving bond of a man and woman in the unique relationship that we call marriage. Is the church really concerned about sex? And does she speak, street, speak strongly and clearly about it? Absolutely. The Catholic Church and Catholics, they care about sex because why? Because we care about people. Sex is not only a a, a pleasure. It's not only where children come from. Certainly we are concerned about children. But sex is also where we learn how to love properly and fully or not at all. We're concerned about love because love, brothers and sisters, we know from Paul's letter to the Corinthians, it's the greatest and most important gift of all, of of God's gift to us. It's the most important thing, though, we need to learn 
and how to do in this world. It's like this. We all come into life inheriting original sin and the wound, a gaping wound called what I call, and some other theologians call the love wound. It's a result of original sin. We feel we're not loved enough, and we don't know properly how to love others. And through life, what do we do? We attempt to love and end up being more deeply wounded. We wound, and, and we're wounded further. We mess up in love. We make mistakes. We hurt, and we get hurt. Furthermore, learning to love other people is also about learning to love ourselves. Love your neighbor as yourself. And you know what? We're human beings. We mess up there, too. And our sexual activity is all tied up with our attempts to find true and lasting love. Unfortunately, it tends to go the other way, in the wrong direction, against the plan of God. That's why people sleep around, they look at porn, get involved with nasty stuff, they dabble about in sex. Because why? They and all, a lot of people are trying to learn what? The deeper reality, how to love. And we learn that all sex has not helped us to really learn how to love. See, if the world's right, then we should experience this incredible love, but it's not going in that direction. It's really hindered our attempts to find true love. As a result, we are even more deeply wounded, and what do we do? We pull back into our shell, into that love-lorn life, our own eternal loneliness. The Catholic Church, building on 2,000 years of wisdom and experience, says this tenderly. This love business, it's difficult. It's a great adventure. You require a map and a guide and a mentor. It's a lifelong quest. Learning to really love is not easy and it's not a quick accomplishment. And that's why you need to make just one commitment to just one person for the whole of your life together so that one man and one woman can embark on this great adventure together. And maybe, just maybe, you will make it to the end and after a lifetime of self-sacrifice, you'll cross the finish line and be able to hold up your heads and your hands and say, we did it. We did it. We learned how to love. Why is that so important? Because this is what it means to be truly human. To be truly human. To learn how to love another person is the great adventure, and that's why God put us in this world. That's why he sent his son. That's why he died to pay for it, to open up again the heart of God so it could pour out in us. Why is this so important? Because he learned how to, lo- to, to learn how to love is also to learn how to penetrate the heart of God who himself is love. You know, one of my favorite musicals, it is my favorite, Les Miserables, but I'm especially moved, everything that comes to that one line, to love another person is to what? Is to see the face of God. You see, brothers and sisters, that's why the Catholic Church and Catholics are obsessed with sex. Because what we do with our private parts is connected with what? It's learning how to love in creativity, faithfulness, purity, and truth. This is the sacred, precious, and beautiful human journey. It is a treasure that is eternal and a beauty that lasts forever. Cheap sex treats it like trash. Cheap and trashy sex is to true love what a plastic cup is to an ancient Chinese vase. Cheap sex, you see, treats people like a plastic cup, something that's so easily used, crushed, and thrown away. So, brothers and sisters, you see, it is a lie and a myth when the secular world shouts out, church is just obsessed with sex. The church is hung up on sex. It's uptight about sex. It's anti-sex. Uh-uh. The church isn't obsessed with sex. The modern media, the secular progressives, they're the ones obsessed with sex. For them, it's nonstop, uninhibited, constant sex with no promise and no uh, production of good. As I said before, I'll tell you what the Catholic Church is really obsessed about. She is, has and always will be, will be obsessed with God, with God's will, with his plan, and with his God's love as it touches our lives. Amen. Amen. God bless you.